Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, frequent flyers, wherever you're dialing in from today. Thank you for joining us in the lounge. Today, my guests, Dave and I, are going to be diving into expectations, communication, and buy-in. The quote we chose for today is, trade your expectations for appreciation and the world changes instantly. When we talk about making challenging decisions, especially when it comes to change, it's often important that we get the buy-in, but it's something we overlook and we have to go through expectation management. Just like we need to do that internally with our teams, we also have to do that with our clients, as well as everybody we interact with in our life. So Dave and I are going to dive into some of the pivots that he had that really required him to focus on his communication and expectation management. And then we're going to dive into the modern flight department in business aviation. Dave, thank you so much for being here with me today. Hey, happy to be here. So as everyone might have noticed, we joined a little bit late. You know, the expectation is that your, your tech is going to work and then it can work and sometimes just not, right? That's the day and age that we live in. Um, and that's also why I love doing a live stream because it can show how you can be agile and pivot through some of the difficulties that arise. And uh, that's that's what it is about, right? It's not about going fast. It's not about being the best. It's about how well you can navigate what comes up in your path so that you can stay on track rather than getting derailed. So thank you for bearing with us. Um, Dave, I know you work right now as a pilot uh, and you're an aviation operations and business executive, your background, you've, you've got a military background, you've done some really big uh, defense contract work. Can you tell me a little bit more about how this communication and expectation management and buy-in has really been a crucial piece of your career? Sure. Uh, as you would imagine with the, the folks that we have as our clientele uh, in the private aviation space, um, they probably have the highest expectations on the planet, right? If you look at the population of people kind of going through their daily life, you know, these mm -hmm. folks have really, really high expectations. Um, whether they're real realistic or not is a, is a different story. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, I think in a, in a, uh, a good example, you know, you mentioned the tech and whether or not it's going to work or, you know, I find it absolutely amazing that I'm here in Tokyo on the other side of the world from where you are. And we're having uh, a, a video conference and it's then being transmitted in some live fashion uh, and being published. Right. So that's spectacular. And I'm doing it from my phone. Right. You know? <laughs> probably the number one system on the airplane, despite all of the other technologies that make the airplanes go almost the speed of sound and, you know, fly for 13, 14 hours. Um, you know, that stuff seems to pale in comparison to the connectivity on the airplane. Mm. And, you know, it could be on fire and it wouldn't be a big deal, but when the internet goes down, it's, a <laughs> um, right. but you know, it's, it's expectations. Uh, that's how, you have that's the how you can succeed in the environment or the only way to succeed in the environment so uh the internet is not like um it's not like a the pipe that you plug into with your coax cable or fiber at home that gets you 100 plus megabytes a second um, it's not traveling in the same path so the signal when you're on the airplane even when you're on an airliner for all of us you know pedestrians that are traveling um you know, that packet of information is going from your phone or from your laptop uh, through a Wi-Fi signal, but then it's leaving the airplane going up, you know, 200 some miles to a satellite and then 200 some miles down to a ground station somewhere else on the planet and then working its way through the Internet to get to whatever the IP address is that you're searching for uh, and communicating with. And it's not so much the speed of megabytes per second, but it's the latency of that path um, so video conferences hate latency so your ping might be when you're at home 10 milliseconds you know my son is a pretty avid video gamer and he's always dad the, the ping on our internet is terrible you know you gotta <laughs> fix that and like uh it's it's 10 it's 10 milliseconds that's really pretty good you know yeah systems on our airplanes whether it's a, an airline or a business jet on the order of 800 milliseconds wow uh, and so it's a problem. So you have to get in there from the very, very beginning before that individual ever sets their expectations of what the thing can and can't do. 
uh, that's your best path. You may not always be successful, but that's your best path. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it's, it's outrageous now what we think of as a delay, right? I mean, I still yeah. remember the, the dial up days and it, you basically hit click and it'd make all this sound. You like go get a, a snack and come back and be on the internet. Um, yeah, yeah. Now, if the page doesn't load like this, we all just instantly get frustrated. Uh, and so that's also maybe a reminder for us to slow down a little bit. I mean, when you say the word 10 milliseconds and that it's noticeable, it kind of makes you take pause and, and go, wait a second. How many milliseconds are in a second? And I'm noticing that and complaining, right? Yeah. Uh, so it's just a really interesting kind of perspective shift there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what is your opinion <laughs> on the phrase uh, under promise over deliver? Uh it's useful sometimes, but I try to avoid it. So my, um, even though I am uh, an aviator, I think probably my last uh, three jobs as the department head, the operations manager, the the one who's accountable for making the team go and go on time. Um, you know, the I, I'm a little bit of a geek, so the the stuff that, that sort of makes me tick is um, is the budget and making sure that it goes on time but goes you know how i said it was going to go right uh, so most cfos that would be my primary customer in that arena you know they don't like swings either way they don't like swings uh plus or minus right you can't mm -hmm. just say hey I, I gave you a 25 million dollar budget and i only spent 12. right right they, they don't <laughs> like that either it does not compute um, they <laughs> want you to be precise um so you know having control of certain things and it's also setting the expectations so when i write the budget you know i tell them these are the things i control these are the contracts i control uh these are the deliverables and how much they cost and then hey these are the things that are affected by how much the boss wants to fly does the boss want to go to hong kong four times in a year, right? Uh, I can't control those things. I can try to predict those things, but I can't control them. So parsing out the budget into things that are mine versus things that are the bosses um, helps to set those expectations. So I can say, look, the stuff that I'm responsible for, you know, the last two years in a row, we were plus or minus 2%, right? right. So the plus or the minus isn't the big thing, um, but it's being precise. Mm. Absolutely. And I think maybe there's there's perhaps a better phrase that we can use, right? Because um, you want to manage the expectation, but you also want to be realistic, right? So we want, to, we want to mitigate the risk. We want to make known the potential pitfalls. Uh, and we don't want to promise something that is unachievable, right? And I think that's where this phrase originated from was don't, don't say you can do it in a day if it really takes three, but you're hoping you can do it in one, right? Mm -hmm. and it's better to be on the other side of that equation. Um, but then you can also set a precedent of over delivering. So when you don't over deliver and exceed those expectations, it's a little bit of a letdown, right? And mm -hmm. so then that you're training your audience, no matter who your audience is, with your behavior and how you show up and what you're doing. Whereas if you can be realistic and name, these are our constants, these are our variables, these are where we might experience swings, then that will be digested and received and understood on a different level than if you, you know, give this kind of bare bones scenario and then come out swinging with all the bells and whistles. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's um, maybe that works, um, you know, in, in a one time scenario that you maybe you're having uh, a, a very short relationship with a person or an entity, but uh, over the lifetime of a relationship, however, you know, it's more important to be reliable, in my opinion. I mean, mm. gosh, kids are in high school now, but sometime when they were like eight or 10 or, you know, we were drawing with crayons and talking about the concept of a family crest and kind of what that means or a coat of arms, you know, and you know, reading stories of, you know, knights and, and uh, crusades and things. And, um, you know, the the family crest that we came up with together, you know, in Crayola was uh, uh, Semper Certus. And yeah. that 
you know, certus meaning certain, right? And the, the story was, hey, always reliable. I may not always be the best. I may not always be um, the fastest or, you know, whatever adjective you want to use um, that may be great or exceptional. Um, you know, it's not semper extraordinaire, you know. Right. Uh, it's semper certus. It's reliable. I'm, I'm reliable mm -hmm. what my relationship is with you. And that goes to setting expectations. Yeah. I love that. That's that's a really great way to depict that. Um, and as you were speaking, kind of tying back to the internet conversation we had, do you want the fastest internet, but high instability, right? And it's not always guaranteed. Or do you want the reliable internet that you can use right. day in and day out where you can get your functions taken care of, et cetera, right? If it's lightning speed for half the day, but then just doesn't work for two days, that's that's not good for business either. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. I love that. Well, if maybe one day you can, uh, you can share the, uh, the Crayola drawing with us. <laughs> I think that would be really, really great. Um, yeah, we have a, a guest who's watching Mikhail saying setting realistic expectations and performing on them is important if you're a member of a sports team. And that's a great analogy, right? You don't have the, the playbook and let, get everyone in agreement to this play and then just go do something else, right? You are, they are relying on you to play your part, your role, so that the entire mm -hmm. play can be done rather than just the individual person. Yeah, absolutely. My my son is a freshman in high school and wrapping up his freshman basketball season. And he's enamored with, you know, um, you know, Booker and Steph Curry and, you know, these amazing shooter point guard kind of players that have just extraordinary moments, you know? Um, and I said, Hey, right now let's just work on reliable. Like let's, mm -hmm. let's get, let's get it so that your teammates know you're always there and yeah. you're always um, contributing. Let's do that first. And then the extraordinary moments will come. Yes. And I'm really glad that you brought that up because you know, we, we have this obsession, especially in the West with the big moments, right? The big transitions of life, the big things that we do. Um, and we forget to celebrate the small moments, those ordinary moments that can actually be extraordinary because you're paying attention to them, right? Uh, something yeah. as simple as smelling uh, the flowers that have just bloomed or picking something from your garden or you know, having a, a, a cuddle with your dog in between calls, right? Those are all normal, small moments. But when you're fully present with them, they can be extraordinary, right? And that presence is what can allow, you know, your son and these other sports people to be able to make those extraordinary moments happen because they're so present and they have the, the feel and the touch and the practice down pat so that in that moment where there's a high adrenaline and you know all these things that are going on, they can actually make that shot rather than, you know, their, their jitters made them shoot a little too far, a little too short. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's great. So reliability is definitely something that we should be focusing on, um, especially if we want buy-in, right? If, if we're trying to get our team to buy into something, if you are not reliable as the leader or as the organization, that's going to be a very difficult thing to get, no matter how simple the change is. Yes, absolutely. I think the the buy-in piece have certainly um, had different uh, reactions to at least kind of my approach to things. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think, you know, in general, my last uh, 10, 11 years in business aviation, um, you know, the role that I have, the niche I've sort of fallen into is like the fixer, you know, it's like, go, go into something. That's this industry. That's not <laughs> yeah. Go into something that's not working and then try to try to, uh, improve the, uh, the operation on a whole bunch of levels. Um, and, uh, you're not going to get anywhere if you don't have a team of people that are like, okay, I get what you're putting down. Right. Yeah. I'm in. Right. I'm, 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 I'm with you uh, on every level with what you're trying to accomplish. Um, and I think, you know, we're fortunate enough in this era of business aviation, um, in this era of employment in a lot of ways. I mean, I'm sure there are people would, that would disagree, but, um, 
you know, it's a pretty good empowerment moment for labor in general. Mm -hmm. um, you know, employers are having to acknowledge uh, the value proposition on both sides, right? Yes. Um, and so that's, I think that's the crux of the buy-in for any employee, any professional team, um, you know, is ultimately as, as selfless as we can try to be, um, you know, even in my military career, you know, at the end of the day, there has to be some calculus on your own of like, okay, this is how I'm going to spend these years of my life, which you don't get back. Right. So that's the most important thing to, to really see eyeball to eyeball with, with people on a new team when you're trying to fix stuff and mm. like, Hey, I value you and your time and your contribution um, now let's see if we can, can, uh, let's make this better. Let's make this the place where we want to be, you know, things of that nature. Um, yeah. that, that's the high level approach that, you know, you have to have, if you, if you don't get there with those people being a, a reliable leader, a reliable manager, um, you're not going to succeed with any of your objectives. Mm. Yeah. People really want to feel seen and heard right? And sometimes when maybe something does need to be fixed, maybe it's part of the system, maybe it's a wider organizational issue, a cultural thing. Um, so when, when that happens, people, maybe they were part of the current way of operating or the current solution. And so there can be some misunderstanding or maybe an emotion that, that comes into play. But when you can get on the same page and it's like, we're, we're working together to, even as you said, evolve, not fix. I mean, in some cases, yes, it's really broken. It needs to be fixed. But in other yeah. cases, it's not really fixing. It's evolving. It's making better. You know, what worked for one airplane doesn't work for five, doesn't work for 10 or 30 or 50. And so evolving and having that open mindset and open communication is really important so that they can understand the value, right? I think that's what you're saying here is, they need to see the value as well as be seen and understood for that buy-in to take place. And that requires open communication. Yeah. I mean, and, and it's, it's fundamentally, you know, personally like, Hey, what's in it for me. And I don't mean that in a, in a bad way. Yeah. You no, know, you have to be able to, to connect with your people and so that they, they know you understand where they're coming from. Right. You know? Yeah. And change, change is um, unnerving, right? It's unsettling because once we get into a groove, we get the, the reps down, right? It feels good. Mm -hmm. we, we get good at it. Now all of a sudden something comes in that's new and we're no longer at that same high level of technical skill or um, ease in which we're performing this action because we have to learn something, right? And so that can be unnerving especially if there's been a big break in between kind of breakthroughs in technology. Um, but as we've seen in recent years, there are so much going on. I mean, the introduction of AI, you know, there's, there's so many different things that are disruptive um, and what we're doing at work may also be triggering for somebody's personal life and vice versa. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I have, um, I look back on my, my childhood, my dad had a Navy career as well. And, you know, we moved all the time, like every two, three years we were moving either, you know, kind of within the town where we lived. We'd sort of always come back to San Diego for a little while and then go away. Um, I'm actually not too far away from where I was born. I was actually born in Kuska, Japan. Um, and I didn't realize it at the time, you know, when you're a teenager and you go to two different high schools, it kind of stinks. Right. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and and a lot of different schools, and and I didn't like it at the time. Uh, I'm sure I was a pretty cranky teenager. Um, I, I would say that most teenagers are cranky because of all the teen, all the the yeah. change they're going through. <laughs> yep. But um, you know, I, I I know I kicked and screamed at different parts of you know my life up until I was 18, and uh, I look back on it now, and you know I can see that that built some skills. Right. Mm -hmm. That built ability to get into a new environment and figure out, OK, you know, who are my friends and allies? Who are people that are threats? Um, and and, you know, what's what's my purpose here? What's the community purpose where we are? 
Um, my mom was always fantastic about, uh, hey, we're in a new town and we're going to go to three parks in the first week that we're there. We're going to go to all the museums. We're going to figure out, you know, where the best grocery store is and kind of, you know, every time you move, it's sort of like a little bit of a habit trail that you're building yeah. with your patterns and where you get all your things. And my mom always made that um, included us kids in that experience of like, Hey, let's go look this up. And this is all like pre-phone. It's like not, right. you know, yeah. <laughs> you had to look look map with yellow it. pages and a map. Yep. <laughs> you know, old school. I mean, I'm, I'm dating myself, but you know, it's, it's uh, all before all of that. So as much as you don't like doing those things, particularly when you're a kid, I can see now that um, those habit patterns are still there, you know, right. and, and it, uh, it, it can be like a little addictive after a while because I know now that like, you know, my kids have moved uh, one, two, three, four, five times, you know, before they got to high school and yeah. we've planted them now for high school. We're like not leaving. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but coming up to that, you know, and, and I can tell like we will move and then like three years in, I'm sort of like, okay. It's What's time next? To, yeah. It's time something now <laughs> <laughs> well that's also very, practice. yeah practice and it, it's very similar to a job cycle you know in the first year of your job you're learning you're figuring out the patterns the where do you go to get stuff done and how do you operate in the system and then the second year it's like you get good at it and then by year three if there's no stretch that's when people start to get bored and they might start to look yeah. elsewhere and so that makes a lot of sense that um, from the moving perspective that can happen too. And, uh, I'm glad that you're acknowledging, you know, yes, it was difficult when you went through it. Cause you know, teenagers, we, we like to complain when we're teenagers, right? Um, uh, everything's hard. Everything's like, you don't understand me, right? It's just yeah. a big, big ordeal that we go through. Um, but I actually had a conversation with a woman this morning. She'll be on the podcast in June. Um, and she, you know, grew up in a military family, um, married military. She was with the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs for 23 years. And she was saying the same exact thing, you know, that moving gave her this ability to be able to learn how to connect with other people, how to mm -hmm. ask questions, how to figure out how to do something um, from scratch, right? Figuring out the new way. And then that also, I think, opens up your mind to new ways of doing things rather than, well, for 25 years of my life, it was like this, or, you know, that kind of thinking of, you know, no, that's the wrong way because I don't do it that way. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So how would you encourage people to, you know, if they're, if there's, if they, if they got a change coming, whether it's a personal change or professional change, how would you encourage them to begin to think about their communication and, um, focus on how they can get buy-in? What are some of the things that they could do? Really good question. Um, you know, use your, well, first off, take a look at stakeholders, right? So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm currently in a job that is, uh, has a finite cycle, right? It's a fixer kind of a thing. And, mm -hmm. you know, we've done a whole lot of work uh, kind of gotten very close to the direction where everything needs to go. Um, so, you know, even the CFO, the company here uh, is aware that, okay, it might be, you know, approaching a time for me to move on. Hmm. Uh, you know, my, my kids are now very aware of what I do and, you know, my, my travel and, you know, flying and, and whatnot. So, you know, they and they've seen me go through my last two departments before here and um my daughter's a junior in high school and you know they both have things to say about my previous jobs <laughs> um, you know and and even sometimes particularly with covid right we're we're having the the office comes into your home it comes into uh, you know through whatever channel and your family gets to be really more familiar um, with your job than, um, perhaps they used to, you know, and, yeah. and in a way that's a good thing. You know, I think kids for decades, just the parents go off, they're at work and the kids don't know what that is, you know? Right. Um, 
but I've, I've had really serious conversations and arguments and, and, you know, people being fairly emotional on my team over different things. And, and my kids have been within earshot of all that. Yeah. So I think that's, that's a good thing. But um, now as I get to this point and like, okay, it might be time for my next job. You know, my kids have something to say. Right. Um, and which is, which is great. I mean, I'm, I'm uh, pleased that they're engaged enough with me that they want to say something. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <know? laughs> Especially at the so teenage that, age, right? Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's kind of cool. Um, but so for me in navigating, okay, what's this next change going to be? Um, you know, I have pretty good habit patterns of checking with stakeholders um, and uh, listening to what they have to say. Um, but, you know, right now, more so uh, than ever, because of the age of my two children, our two yeah. children, um, you know, that sounding board of checking with stakeholders is starting with uh, with my family and with my children, I think more so than it ever has. Right. I mean, I certainly check in with Bridget, you yeah. know, about things and, and that's a pretty easy expectation that you would have that kind of communication with your partner. Yes. Um, but it is a new thing to have my my kids chiming in and say, you know, well, that last person was really a jerk. So make sure you avoid that next time. Yeah. You know, things like that. New perspectives. Uh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. So I, I would say it's, you know, you're, you're writing down, hey, who are my stakeholders? Who are my most important stakeholders? And then you're starting with them as you kind of review that, that change management mm. uh, map. That mm, I like that change management map. Um, because that's a great way to think about it. You know, there's no right path necessarily. It's like, here's the starting point. Here's the ending point. There's many ways to get between those two points. It doesn't have to be a straight line, but making sure that you're uh, navigating your way there with intention, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's the most important thing. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. You know, it's um, it's the, your children often can give you such great refreshing feedback. And, you know, we're very good at telling ourselves stories as humans, right? Uh -huh. And we can justify anything. We can find the loophole in our own logic and thinking to be like why that thing was okay, even though maybe it's not totally aligned with our values. Or, you know, once we cool down, we go, oh, maybe that was not the best course of action, right? Um, but, but really being able to uh, check in with yourself and reflect on these things. And then, you know, you build that skill set over time. Um, and, and looking at it as a map gives you that flexibility of, you know, it's not this one path you have to take. You get the opportunity to um, navigate. And then as you're navigating, you might get new information, right? And then that information will inform your next choice, your next decision on which direction you go, what action you take. Yeah. Beautiful. I think you know, the, particularly what I'm noticing now is that the um, the influence of children, uh, and this is pretty uh, pretty um, high level or um, intimate in a way, but you know, children really keep you present mm. more. So, like we get all, you know, tripped up with all sorts of cross wires and signals and priorities and everything. Um, but you start actually listening to what your kids think, um, even when they're little, you know. Right, what they can reflect uh, back to you. When, when, you know, they're so much more able to be very present and unbiased. Um, mm -hmm. You know, certainly when, like, man, middle school really stinks. Middle, middle school is awful for children because they, they don't have any social skills, right? And they're just learning all this stuff. <laughs> trying to figure out what it means to be a friend. I mean, so it's really yeah. a challenge for them, but man, they, they are, um, they are more often than not, like they're, you can see their biases being created in right. them. Yeah. Um, but you can see when they look at you and, and, you know, say something that is, you're like, wow, I, I, I guess I didn't even realize that I did that, you know, right. There's you have to. So whether they're your biological kids or just like somebody in your community that you have a relationship with, with kids, it's really important. Yes. I love that. Um, you know, and animals are a really great 
reflection back to because animals have no filter, right? They don't care if you get annoyed with them. They're going to give you that look, or, you know, they're going to express the joy or the displeasure. And, you know, it's often through, as you said, this conditioning we go through and then adopting the bias and through our lived experience, we then start to form the personality and like what we think, mm -hmm. how do we want to fit in? And um, it's really important to get new perspectives on that. Um, you know, the book that I had last year at um, the CALS event, the Surrounded by Idiots, they talk about at the end, if you have all of the same person, no matter what type, no matter what personality type in the group, the objective does not get achieved like ever <laughs> because, right. you know, you're, you're then having competing personalities with each, you know, each one has a different reason for why it doesn't work, but that's why we need the broad lens. We need the, the, the different genders, the different, you know, nationalities, the different ages, the different technical and social skills, all of those things are super, super important so that we can get a complete picture and also mm -hmm. challenge those biases and assumptions because oftentimes that also the, the assumption, the bias, that's why we're not getting buy-in. Maybe we haven't communicated because we've made an assumption. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fair enough. Fair yeah. enough. I, uh, I Have you seen the assume math qu equation? I have not. You have to tell me okay, about that I'm one. I'm going to put it up on the screen so everyone can see it. I love to use this because it always makes people giggle. But when you assume, <laughs> you make an ass of you and me, oh, right? Yeah. Like the, that's, it, we're both in trouble here because of an assumption. So um, I always like to do that as a little icebreaker and, you know, teams are always giggling, uh, but it's very true. And we, we often hold assumptions that we don't realize that we hold. Um, I was on a podcast a couple of weeks ago with someone who said that there's, <clears throat> I want to say it's with Harvard, but you can take all these different tests to see where you might hold bias, where you might hold uh, a certain viewpoint. And, you know, he shared with everyone that he was, he's like, I'm horrified to find that I'm mildly racist, you know, based on how I answered this and mildly sexist. And we had this whole conversation around, well, the fact that you're horrified means that you are now going to be intentional about shifting that, you know, but it was, he went back and examined and where did that come from? And all of those things. So it's really interesting. Sometimes we hold a viewpoint of how we are, but the reality is we're actually very different. So getting the perspective, getting the challenge is how we can become more self-aware. And then that ultimately will improve our relationships with ourselves, with our peers, our, our team, our partner, our children. Uh, so I thought that was really powerful. Yeah, that is for sure. Um, I think, you know, you're talking about being um, reflective and being able, you know, being aware of kind of where you are um, and using, I mean, clearly that was a Harvard test that somebody's like, I'm going to actually do something formal here to right. evaluate. Um, you know, I think um, one of the fantastic things that comes from a, a, not even a military career, but just any amount of time in the military um, is learning the, the skill of a formal debrief of whatever mm -hmm. it is you did. Um, and, you know, tying it into buy-in as well when you're debriefing with someone, whether it's a client or a customer or somebody that's a service provider for you, um, you know, the, the ability to debrief in um, a very unvarnished but... Um, uh, constructive criticism, mm -hmm. right? We all approach that moment of like, okay, I, I really want to do well. And this doesn't sound like it went well, right? We all take that personal. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the things I learned in the Navy um, is how to use word patterns in the debrief that depersonalize the entire thing. Mm. So instead of saying, hey, Sarah, you were not at the right altitude and your engagement or, you know, your search and rescue platform uh, was five minutes late to the party, right? Um, the, the technique for that is, you know, I'm not going to say Sarah, I'm going to say search and rescue one or fighter two and three 
you know, you, you use a call sign uh, or some other label that's not Sarah or Jim or John. Mm -hmm. uh, just that really simple thing um, takes the edge off that taking it personally kind of feeling. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and it allows you to have an out of body experience in a way, in a professional sort of way that you can sit over here and then you can listen to the debrief and all the machinations of what just happened and what went in the right direction and what went in the wrong direction. And then just go, Oh yeah. Search and rescue one was not in the right position. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know? can be more objective and you can view it from that 30,000 foot view rather than be in it and have the emotional yeah. experience. Yeah. And that, that enables you to be more engaged in the, the debrief. Um, right. You can be more critical of yourself because you're not even talking about yourself anymore. You're talking right. about the, you're not defensive anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I, and I think having that ability to like, I've come into some organizations that were pretty dysfunctional and then starting that habit pattern of like, Hey, let's talk about what happened and then completely sanitizing all of the entities um, and talking about it that way. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, builds trust um, and gets more buy-in because people now are going to come to the table uh, more able to self-critique, right. um, you know, and um, you know to to really be unvarnished in what they're um, what they're reviewing, and that makes them feel better, right? So they're mm -hmm. now the next debrief and the next debrief, they're like, okay, let's do this, right? Yeah. Instead of well, I don't know if I want to hear this. Right. That's a great, that's a great technique. And, you know, as, as you're familiar with flying, right, there's always a post-flight. It's, it's always a pre-flight and a post-flight. That is just part of the procedure. And I mean, when they don't happen, that's when we have issues, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, you know, high-performing teams that this is something they should be doing on a regular basis. Uh, you know, what worked well, what could be improved? And it's not about pointing fingers or, you know, assigning blame is just let's understand why it didn't go the way we expected, right? Back to the expectation. Maybe there was communication pitfall or break, um, you know, and then that allows you to improve it for the next time, as well as manage the expectation better because you've now learned something. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah that's a, I love that. Now, what if you have a situation where there's just two people, right? Or you're maybe you are having a conversation with another person where the, it's between you and that person. How could you de-escalate? Because you obviously can't depersonalize, right? So how would you, you de-escalate something like that? You can a little bit. I mean, you still can frame it as something that's um, that's not that person, right? Okay. You know, I first off, my personal approach um, after doing this for a while, when you debrief with somebody that maybe had a significant failure, mm. uh, I will always approach that debrief, that exploration um, with, hey, let's question the system first before we question the person, right? Mm. So um, what, are, what are all the contextual things that um, contributed and led to uh, you know, for a Six Sigma term led to the escape, right? The escape mm -hmm. and the process of, you know, it was supposed to do this and it, you know, went off the rails somewhere. Yeah. Um, so, you know, let's look at the system first, um, you know, before we get to the person, um, that certainly uh, takes the edge off, you know, yeah. for, for that person, um, you know, it, you can have like a peer to peer debrief, but you know, right now, I think what we're talking about is a, a manager to a, a team player kind of a debrief where there's mm -hmm. there's a hierarchy there. Um, if you question the system first, um, you, you take a whole lot of steam out of that mm. conversation, right? Because you, you know it's a difficult conversation for both of you. You know, I mean, I don't like to be uh, rude and, and unsupportive of the people that I work with and they certainly, I, I don't know anybody that, you know, uh, enjoys to, um, you know, get a really negative debrief about something. <laughs> <that>. Right. <laughs> I mean, I, I had it, my 
previous department, I had a really serious conversation with my boss and my boss's boss um, at a very large firm uh, about the flight operation broadly. And, you know, finally I had to say, look, nobody on this team shows up to work saying, you know what, I'm going to up today. Right. Right. Yeah. No, nobody shows up like that. So let's stop treating them like they intended to do what happened. Right. So by questioning the system, that puts the other person um, in a different frame of mind. It allows them to um, kind of exhale a little bit and feel supported. Um, and, you know, that whole question, the system thing, you know, and this is this is a little bit of lore, but I do know a flight instructor that was involved and adjacent to this. So there's a, a Navy flight school uh, anecdote, right? So there's a, a helicopter flying around the landing pattern uh, in, you know, Southern Alabama, Pensacola, Florida, where flight school is. And, you know, the, the field is sort of nearby a residential area. And so the helicopter goes on the downwind and it goes by wow. over houses and the, uh, the, the flight student is, you know, an ensign in the Navy and probably 22, 23 years old. And the instructor is a pretty senior seasoned multiple deployment Lieutenant, right? And, and there's definitely a hierarchy and definitely a, like, hey, I'm, I'm going to, you know, show you what's what and you got to do what I say. And, you know, it's at a part in the program where the student should be pretty much doing things on their own. Yeah. And so they're on the downwind and they make an approach and it's OK. And then they go on the downwind and they make another approach and the air work is just getting worse and worse. And the student is just noticeably getting more and more agitated and insecure about their performance. And so finally. You know, the instructor, they land on the grass on the field and the instructor just says, now, wait a minute, you know, looks across the cockpit and says, what is going on? You're just like, you know, getting worse every time. And <laughs> student finally says, well, sir. Every time we go on the downwind, we're flying over my house and my wife is there sending all of the furniture out onto the front lawn. <laughs> so every time I fly over, more of my furniture is on the front lawn. And so, you know, the instructor is like, all right, fine, we're done. We're going to go back. So when it comes to like questioning the system, you know, right. or you question the person, I mean, even in that moment, you're not the, the questioning the system part, questioning the context right. is just what's going on with you. Right. Right. And that was clearly something that was beyond his control, yes. the student's control, and clearly something that is uh, very, you know, putting him in a very vulnerable spot. And like, you know, that would be difficult for anybody to right. be at top performance when they're watching that, you know, through the chin bubble every time they fly over on the deck. <laughs> yeah. So that question the system really start to drill down on all the different things about the why, because again, nobody shows up saying, I'm going to really screw it up today. Right. Yeah, so. no, that's, that's great. And I think that's a, that's a wonderful reminder is that, you know, nobody, even when the worst thing happens, it's not, you're right. They don't wake up thinking I'm going to go and do this today, right? I'm just going to be the worst that I can be <laughs> and make all these mistakes, you know, so really uncovering, usually there is um, something systemic as well as personal is, is very mm -hmm. rare that it's just one, right? Um, and that's why it's important to also take care of our people and to communicate with them and to understand what is going on in their worlds so that we can, you know, be able to have these more crucial conversations without the stakes feeling so high all the time. Yeah. For sure. You know, you mentioned having the the whoop band and tracking your sleep cycles and things. Yep. And earlier in our session here, we were talking about slowing down and being more aware, being more personally aware. Um, I mean, I just got over a, a non COVID, just like respiratory infection kind of thing. And so I still have a little bit of a cough. Um, but it was, and, and I'm, you know, I'm 55 almost, and this still happens. This still happens yeah. where I have a bad night's sleep and sort of tossing and turning. You know, I'm not sick. I don't have any symptoms, right? So I don't go, oh, I'm sick, right? right? But I have a bad night's sleep. And then the next day is kind of overshadowed by that because um, I'm short. Maybe I'm right. short with my kids. I'm short with a coworker. I'm tired. 
um, you know, things are definitely affected by that bad night's sleep. And then sure enough, like by that night, okay, now I got a sniffle. Like now I feel it like, like I'm, I'm starting to get sick. Um, you know, and, and it doesn't have to be necessarily anything major. It's just a cold, right? Yeah. All of us, but you know, it was happening in that, that night sleep that didn't go as it should. And then all that next day, I should have been aware, right? I should have known like, you know what, I'm just going to take it easy today. Maybe I'm going to cancel a meeting. I'm going to go do X and Y or, you know, go have a steam. I'm going to eat really well because I know this is coming. Yes. Right? And I, I still didn't see it. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> We're so good at not seeing things we don't want to see, right? Um, I probably could win an award for that <laughs> when we talk about certain things I've done in my life. But um, yeah, it's amazing. You know, I actually, I told you I, I'm like in a, <clears throat> a group with my best friend and his wife. And he messaged me last week like, Sarah, 7% recovery. What's going on? You know, are you getting sick? And I was like, no, I'm fine. I'm not getting sick. I'm just at high altitude snowboarding all day. So, and you know, I'm not getting enough sleep based on the sleep debt that I had and everything. And guess what happened? I got a little cold yeah. because the thing, I mean, and I should have known because the thing told me like two of your five health markers are off and that's usually the first signal. Um, I did modify what I did. So I had a very tiny cold, but even with the data staring at a graph, I was like, no, I'm not getting sick. Surely not. Like, I'll be fine. <laughs> so, uh, yes, we're, we're masters of story. Yeah. Um, but yes, no, that's, it's important to have, build the awareness, right? That's really all it is. When we talk about expectations, communication, getting buy-in, building your own awareness is going to help with all of those things and then help when the decisions, if you start to do it with the small decisions, when the big ones come or the challenging ones come, you have the skill set and you have the rapport and the bond in order to be able to navigate together, you know, shoulder to, oops. Oh, I got you. There back. we go. Yep. See tech, all the tech stuff. <laughs> um, but then you can navigate shoulder to shoulder going through something rather than um, feeling like it's such a struggle the whole way, right? Because you've, you've spent the time to build the skill set for going through change for, for getting buy-in. Um, and, you know, we talked before we went live about the buy-in being even when you just convince someone to do something, right? Like, what are you going to have for dinner? Or, or where are you going to go on the next holiday? Like, that's also getting buy-in. So you're actually doing it a lot uh, and bringing your awareness to that can help you be more intentional when you need to do it for the bigger things. Sure. Absolutely. So with all of this, you know, I know you had the pivots through the military life, getting into the civilian world. You had some really big career pivots where you had to start all over through 9-11 and the GFC. Um, how how did all of these skills help you really navigate that? And, and what was it that stood out to you the most? That's a great question. I think I've never looked at it quite that holistically as far as tracking kind of every one of those pivots. Um, mm. But I think the, what I mentioned before about checking with your stakeholders, you know, starting with your closest circle first and kind of going out from there. Um, I think that's probably, um, that was probably the essence of what enabled me to be successful in each one of those. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the, we talked a little bit about this. I kind of sent you a, l a little, a few bullets, but, you know, moving into, you know, my first assigned aircraft in the Navy was a dying platform. Yes. It was just the end of its life cycle. Right. So I looked at that as like, oh my gosh, that's not going to be a successful career for me. Right. Mm -hmm. So your life cycle was completely misaligned with the life cycle of this airplane. And, you know, those are things you can't control. So from, from that, you know, I, I did everything that I could to try to kind of make my own path, right? I'm going to yeah. pick a new, a new airplane in the Navy that I can try to pursue, um, you know, and, and things didn't work out swimmingly um, as far as like, hey, I'm, you can't just reach out and say, I'm going to go do this now, right? Things sort of start to develop and start to fall into place. And you you make the best of the situation 
um, by being grateful. And then all of a sudden things seem a little bit uh, better than what you had expected. Um, so moving to a different airplane and then deciding, okay, well, maybe the Navy is not going to have this career path the way I expected. I'll leave the Navy. Well, I chose to go to the airlines in June of 2001. Um, and we can all imagine, and we know now, like what, what happened with that. I never wanted to be an airline pilot, but I thought if I'm only working 12 days a month, what could I do with the other 18? Mm -hmm. So that was the draw, but that was June of September, you know, June of 2001, September happened and the airline industry imploded yeah. and, uh, the Navy said, Hey, can you come back in? Uh, so I did and then pivoted to a different career path in the Navy that I hadn't ever really known anything about, which was the logistics side of flying you know, cargo and some very sensitive stuff around the world. Um, and so that ended up being the second half of my Navy career. Um, you know, in between there, I got a business degree. Um, the second part of my career was in the reserves, which is part time mostly. Mm -hmm. So after business school, I got recruited to go run a commercial real estate portfolio. Um, and so that was sort of another moment of like, okay, this is it. I'm off to the races. This is my expected path when I do this, you know? Yeah. So that was 2006 and the last financial crisis, which was precipitated by bad real estate investments. Yeah. You know, I was just exactly in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah. Uh, but strangely enough, the company that I was working for and as it was imploding, um, they had a business airplane and I didn't know anything about that. I didn't mm. know really like what business aviation was all about. Um, but all of a sudden, you know, my CFO says, hey, we, we've got, we need to refinance the, the corporate jet, the company jet. I'm like, oh, all right. And then it became like, well, we're going to get rid of the mechanic. We're going to lay him off. So can you go find some contract maintenance? Okay, I've never done that before, but I'll figure it out. And so I started mm -hmm. interviewing with Jet Aviation, Clay Lacey, some of those people to try to get mm -hmm. the service that we needed. And then they said, well, we just laid off the co-pilot. Can you fly? <laughs> and I was I was still flying in the Navy. I was flying the C-130 at the time. Um, but I was working for the CFO with financial transactions and loans and banks like 12, 13 hours a day. Wow. And, and you said this earlier in our talk today, you know, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Mm -hmm. So I looked at them and I said, I can, but I shouldn't. We yeah. shouldn't because it's not safe, right? This is not going to be successful for me. Um, but ultimately, uh, that path ended and I had to pivot again. Uh, I went to work for Sikorsky Aircraft and started learning how they build helicopters uh, for the Navy and the Army. Um, that was just a great learning experience, but not a place where I wanted to hang my hat long term. Yeah. Uh, and so from there, I finally said, OK, I'm going to go dive into this aviation thing. And that's kind of where I ended up about over a decade ago. And yeah. uh, every one of those moments was take stock and where I am, what I have, uh, the, the grateful component of like, okay, wh what are the good cards in my hand right yeah. now? Um, check in with my closest stakeholders. So, you know, Bridget, my kids were really little at the time. Um, but lots of, you know, I have a, kind of before the term, I think was made popular, like the personal board, you know, have yes. your board members. Yes. Um, you know, I have some really good friends that are in a broad spectrum of industries and backgrounds and age um, that I can check in with and go, hey, what do you think? Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, from there, it, it then it comes into a networking uh, task, right, of trying to figure yeah. out, okay, what I think I should be doing. Let me go check in with more people two degrees of separation away or three degrees. Right. Right. Um, and then kind of figure out where you land. Yeah. I love that. It's uh it's an ever iterative process, right? Mm -hmm. And I love that you highlighted that some of these pivots, you know, you, you get there and you like do all this work and you feel like, ah, oh, it's the thing that I'm going to do now. And then it can change again. And that's okay. Cause ultimately that's, 
the, the stepping stone to get to where you currently are. Um, and you learn lessons along the way. And this morning I wrote a quote down, when I'm grateful for what I have, I can feel good along the way to what I desire. Sure. And so finding what you can be grateful for about, even if you have, even if the job's not so exciting or the your boss, direct boss or colleague is annoying to you, or maybe there's some things that you're working through, what can you find that you enjoy about it? What are you taking away? What's going to help you get to the next thing? Because that's such a powerful reframe and our brains are wired to look for what we focus on, right? Like if I ask you, hey, Dave, in your room right now, what? How? look around and tell me how many things are, are brown. Right. Right. And then I say, okay, well, what was red? You're not going to be able to tell me because that's not what you were focused on. Sure. Right. And so when we start to train ourselves to focus on those positive things that we do have, then that's how, as you mentioned, when you go through those pivots, you can see the opportunity that's there because you can you, you can start to connect the dots because your awareness is is on, you're you're tuned in, and you know, you're not just sitting there grumbling about how terrible it is or woe is me, this happened. Uh, but rather, what can I do with this? And where do I go from here? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's the silver lining or, you know, in, in a more, I guess, um, not aggressive. That's too strong of a word. You know, what's the opportunity and the challenge? We've all heard that. Yeah. You know, but it's um, see what you want to see. Yeah. There's a component of that. I mean, that cuts both ways, right? You can be delirious, delusion. <laughs> right. Right. That doesn't really. Um, I don't know. Some kids show. I remember watching with my kids, and you know, one of the characters in the kids show says, "Have you ever seen a pterodactyl?" Yeah. <laughs> The other, the other character says no, but then the first character says, did you want to see a pterodactyl? Yeah. You know? So my little kids are like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <I love> it. <laughs> right. Sometimes it's about, did we, did we want it in the first place? Right. A lot of times the things that we do sometimes they're, um, what someone else told us we should do, what someone else told us would be successful. Right. Yeah. And, and that you know, stopping to question, is that what I want? Do I, do I want that result? Do I, do I desire that? And, you know, being honest with yourself. Um, some people think, oh, I've, I've been down the path so far. Like, how could I possibly do anything else? Well, there's many, many stories of, of successful people having multiple businesses in multiple categories and starting all over multiple times, right? That's that we never hear about that. We just see the big thing in the news and wow, look at all this success, but what about all the stuff before that, right? It's the under the iceberg, under the water that we don't see. Uh, and, you know, when you are connected, then, and you do want to see the pterodactyl, right? Then you're going to do whatever it takes to to get there. Um, yeah. But when you're not connected, that's when you can flounder. That's when you can chase all the things, shiny object syndrome, procrastinate, et cetera. Shiny object syndrome. Yeah. Something sparkly. Oh yeah. I used to get that a lot. I'd be like, Ooh, squirrel. Ooh, what is that? What about this? <laughs> you know, like start a bunch of things, but never really finish them. And I've definitely got the initiator energy. So I've also learned like, how can I best serve by having the initiator energy, getting things going, putting people in the right place, and then going to the next thing. Cause mm -hmm. that's where I'm going to have the most oomph in my contribution. Right. If you then ask me to do all the details and the things that we're part of that idea, I might be like, uh-uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> I have too much energy. I got to go do something else. Uh, so recognizing that and, and just, I, you know, acknowledge it. You, it's not about changing yourself or fixing, fixing, right? There's no one right way, but how can you best serve with your energy, your skill set, your drive, all of those things. And remember, that's going to be different at different times, different ages, different stages of life, different projects. Right. Yeah. If you if you brought me in on an accounting project, I'd be like, snore. What can what can I do to get <laughs> out of here? I'd I'd be like, what did I do to make you really mad, Dave? Because I don't I don't know how to. This is not my thing. Right. Um, that's okay because there's people where that lights them up, and then figuring out how the numbers work and the budget, and it's a big puzzle. And solving that is what gives them the dopamine and gives them the drive, and that's wonderful. So that's how we can all 
you know, maybe we're on the right bus, but we're not in the right seat. Or for our aviation people out there, you know, we're on the right airplane. We're just not in the right seat. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Amazing. So you already touched on the question of the board of directors, which I always ask my guests. Um, so I'd like to ask, what do you think your superpower is, Dave? Oh, goodness. Um, superpower. I can fly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That is a good superpower. Uh, yeah. No, I, we ask our kids that, like, what if you could have a superpower, what would it be, you know? And yeah. usually what comes up is, is uh, I can fly. I, I always actually chose to be invisible. Um, oh. No, but uh, the Invisible Man. But um, Oh, my gosh. That movie. <laughs> yeah. I haven't seen it, but I saw the commercial, and I was like, nope, not for yeah. me. <laughs> That's right. That's the creepy side of the Invisible Man. Um yes. You know, I think, um, and I do thankfully at the, um, the advice and recommendation, um, of actually the CFO of the company, the, the commercial real estate investment firm that I work for, um, you know, I have one of his quotes is at the bottom of my resume and it's been there since I left that company, um, in 2009. Um, and it's, um, Dave can talk to the shareholders and the guys fixing the AC. Hmm. Uh, and so that was his um, way of appreciating uh, like what he thought was my superpower. Um, yeah. So I can be in a room of people um, or whatever the forum is. Um, doesn't This doesn't mean that I'm the, the center of attention or, you know, the, the, uh, the guest speaker or the keynote mm -hmm. speaker. Um, but I can, I can speak to, you know, any part of the spectrum of, um, you know, people and kind of where, where they come from and what they're all about. You know, I, I'm able to, to have a good conversation or relate to them, connect with them, um, and make, whatever that moment is, whether it's actually a part of the job that I'm working on, or if it's just uh, um, a, a social connection or somebody at the grocery store, you know, just mm -hmm. being to, um, to connect with people wherever they are. Um, and, you know, I, I certainly have, even my, my kids, my kids, like just recently, my daughter said, well, dad, you're kind of intimidating, <laughs> you know, and she, didn't mean it in a, in a negative way, but, you know, we have friends in the neighborhood or some of, you know, some of her friends and, you know, there's, there's stuff in the wall in my office of, you know, airplanes and my squ squadron stuff and whatever. And they, they know that, you know, I'm a retired commander. Um, it, it's that I can see it now. Like I never really thought of it cause it's just me, you know? And, yeah. Um, but, She's like, yeah, you know, that, that, that could be the case or, you know, that that's going on. Um, so that's, you know, her, a teenager kind of relating her friends and how their view of me um, affects how they relate to me, you know? Yeah. But for people that don't have that uh, view of my context, you know, they don't know me from Adam. I'm just at a cocktail party. Right. Or whatever, you know? um, in that moment, it's, you know, I can get somebody talking about what's important to them and um, that ability, you know, again, it's not the center of attention, but that has always helped me in a professional sense of, you know, being able to talk to a bunch of mechanics, you know, mm -hmm. like, um, gosh, probably the very first time that that really like hit me smack in the face, we're in the middle of a deployment in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Um, you know, I grew up working on cars, so um, with, you know, and family members. So that's something pretty familiar to me. But we had an aircraft that the uh, helicopter with the transmission that had to be changed. And the next day we had a really big mission. It was completely unexpected that we were going to have mm -hmm. to do. That. It was like all hands on deck all night long. Um, and, you know, instead of being, you know, back in my office with a, a stack of papers, you know, I was in my flight suit uh, on the helicopter turning wrenches and, 
you know, moving parts around and just there with all, all the guys. And, you know, that's when they realized that, you know, Hey, I can work my way through some of these, uh, challenges. I know my way around a toolbox. Um, and I'm not afraid to get my hands dirty. Um, you know, that was a, that was a, a crucible moment, I think with them that built a lot of trust and they they realized like, Hey, you're not, um, you're not just the aviator that is going to, you know, walk on the heads of all the mechanics, right? Yes. You, you, you know what we're all about. And man, that, that was like probably in the first third of a six, seven month deployment mm. and dramatic shift in, in the, the social interaction with that group of people, yeah. um, you know, the next two thirds of the deployment. Absolutely. Uh, so I think that's probably my, superpower i guess is just being able yeah that connection piece is so so important and you know recognizing that underneath the title or what somebody does they're still human right and so that no one deserves to be treated better than someone else just because of that i mean i'm sure many people have experienced meeting someone and not being given the time of day because they didn't hold a title or they didn't do you know the thing that this person was looking for in terms of status. And then later, you know, um, they might find out that, oh, that was an important person, but I've now, you know, really damaged the relationship because I didn't treat them well. Yeah. Um, so that's, yeah, no, that's really cool. Um, so what would you say? The third question that I always ask my guests is, you know, there's a, another alien life form that comes to earth and they, they meet you as the first human. So what do they get when they meet you? Oh, wow. Um, well, my, my wife, Bridget actually is an alien. Um, <laughs> she, she's an actress and she was, uh, uh, she did an episode of Star Trek. Nice. Uh, and she was some alien with, I don't know, some sort of prosthesis makeup kind of thing yeah, on her. Yeah. But she's the, and I don't remember the name of the character. Um, but she, the only one of that species in the history of the the whole you know arc wow of this. yeah she's the only one um so even now she'll get her agent will send her a box of like star trek trading cards you know when she has it. she yeah. signs sends them back um, I, so, I have uh, rod roddenberry on the show next week actually oh, really? yeah wow. yeah he's gonna be my guest next week um so i think yeah, so Bridget's an alien, and I guess she was interested enough in me to. <laughs> so, Mary, um, so what do they get from me? I think um, it's. I guess it would be related to you know the previous answer somewhat. It's like, mm -hmm. hey, um, you know, tell me about you and and what do you do and what's important to you and and how do you see things and it's just that that curiosity. Um, that curiosity, right? I mean, yeah. I'm trying to um, help both of my children as they embark on their uh, social path of dating. You know, my, mm -hmm. my freshman son <laughs> has a very serious girlfriend, a little too serious, I think. <laughs> but, you know, there's those conversations of like, well, I don't know how to talk to, you know, so-and-so, right? The The boy that I think is cute or the the girl that i think is cute or attractive or yeah the um i don't remember which one of the despicable me episodes but it's you know when the oldest of the daughters sees the the kid with the slicked hair and the black leather jacket uh -huh. you know? yeah 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 he says hi i'm margo <laughs> <laughs> ask a question and she just says i'm margo so trying to teach my kids like, okay, when you're, when you're wrestling with that sort of, um, reaction, you know, that chemistry, like, oh my God, what do I do with that? Right. What do I say? What do I say? You know, you don't have to say so much, anything, just ask. Yes. Right? Ask, just ask. I love that. Ask like what's up with you or what do you, think about this or just really, really simple questions, you know, mm -hmm. do, do you like the beach? Like just mm -hmm. ask, right? So, yeah. and it could make up anything and you just get somebody to start 
opening up and yeah. that's what that's what the alien would hopefully get from me awesome well we would learn a lot because you would be asking lots of questions so hopefully they do get to meet you <laughs> Um, Dave, this has been so much fun and amazing. Thank you so much for being on the show with me today. If people would like to connect or learn more, where can they go to? What's the best place for them to reach out? Um, probably LinkedIn. Uh, I'm not much on any of the other social media platforms other than okay. LinkedIn. Okay. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I'm there. So awesome. Well, great. That's up there for everyone to see on the screen. Uh, so thank you again, Dave. Thank you for dialing in from Tokyo and showing everyone how we can pivot through some technology gaffes and how we can connect no matter where we are in the world. It's been really great to have you on the show. It's been a delight. Thanks for the invitation. Absolutely. And for everyone else still watching, please join us next week, February 22nd, for Rod Roddenberry. He's the son of Gene Roddenberry, founder of Star Trek. And that's going to be going live at 2 p.m. Central. So we'll see you next week.